I would invite John Watson to come up and take his place here. John is going to go into detail about a instrument that has long been, its existence has long been known, but much more has been learned about it by some intensive uh, study on his part, and uh, uh, Tom and Michelle Winter as well, and so let's jump right into that. You've probably heard of the amazing thing that happens sometimes in the natural world when a fragile living organism is almost perfectly preserved for millions of years because a drop of tree sap just happened to fall on it, encasing it in amber. As musical instrument organologists, we have our own version of this, sometimes preserving an instrument long past when all other examples of its period have vanished. No, not entombed in amber, but frozen, perhaps as marquetry in a 16th century cathedral in Genoa, or as a photorealistic marquetry in the 15th century study of Duke Federico in Urbino, Italy. Tom Strange has told us about the Berendt Grand Piano from the beginning of what we can call recorded American, North American keyboard history. The subject of this presentation is about an instrument that is from, to coin a phrase, American keyboard prehistory. I'm talking about this instrument, uh, talking about this instrument uh, at the Moravian Historical Society in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, where it has stood as far back as anyone knows. For brevity, we'll call it the MHS piano. It has only four octaves, of which less than half have dampers. And what dampers it does have can be disabled. And curiously, the hammers can be shifted to strike either with a hard metal tip, presumably to create a brittle harpsichord-like sound, or with its leather-covered tip to produce what we might expect to be a slightly more piano-like sound. Credit for first calling attention to this ancient piano goes to Lawrence Libin, whose presentation about it at the 1991 AMIS meeting was my first introdu introduction to it. 20 plus years later at our 2018 meeting, he again pointed it out to a group of us and suggested someone needs to make a copy. A copy would, of course, let us hear what it sounded like. But more importantly, it would spawn a great deal more research into its mysterious place in musical history. Laurie's wish was heard by Tom and Michelle Winter. Uh, Tom is the silver-haired gent in this photo from that meeting. The Winters took up the challenge to make that reproduction, and I'll be eternally grateful to them that they invited me to join the effort. We soon descended on the piano's home in Nazareth at the Moravian Historical Society for an in-depth examination of the instrument. Laurie Libin, whose vision continued to inspire the effort, joined us for part of the time. The months of work observing and copying every detail of a centuries-old artifact is in, every, in a very real sense a way to walk in the shoes of the original maker virtually stepping into that historical workshop to face the same challenges and through observing how the maker solved each design question, hopefully we would begin to uh, see more about the maker and the larger world that gave rise to such an instrument. And that's why making a copy of this particular instrument was so irresistible. We knew so little about what the maker was thinking the object seems not to fit any standard type. It's a, not a square piano or a grand piano and doesn't even look quite like any other upright piano we'd seen. We had questions. Question number one, who made the instrument? John Coster had already proven through scientific wood identification that it was, very surprisingly, made on this side of the Atlantic so it was potentially the earliest American-made piano. Question number two, uh, when was it made? Can there be an explanation for how a piano could be made in Pennsylvania decades earlier than expected? 
There's a cherished belief among the Moravians in Nazareth that the instrument might have appeared as early as 1746. But that seemed highly improbable, considering that in the middle of the 18th century, pianos were still such a new idea that they were seldom found outside the courts of Europe. It seemed ludicrous that one could be found, let alone made, on the frontier of colonial Pennsylvania. Number three. I guess we're one ahead, aren't we? Number three, why was the piano designed to provide two very different kinds of sound? Its hammers could be shifted so that hard metal tip or soft leather covered tip would strike the strings. Pianos with stops capable of changing tone quality became fashionable in later continental Europe. But what put the idea in this early Pennsylvania maker's uh, mind? Uh, question number four, why are there so few dampers and why provide a hand stop uh, to disengage them entirely? It was not an easy feature to design and make, but apparently was considered worth the effort. Two more mysteries turned up during our closer examination and analysis of the instrument. Question number five. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know what's causing it to keep jumping ahead. Uh, how did the maker acquire the high level of knowledge and skill evident in the original instrument? This was clearly not the workmanship or mechanical design we would expect of a dabbler on the frontier of Pennsylvania. The Winters and I have been copying early keyboard instruments for 50 years, uh, yet matching the workmanship of the original instrument was a worthy challenge. The piano's straightforward, clean, and accurate craftsmanship indicates the artisan was confident and deeply experienced in the craft. And question number six, why did the maker employ even earlier principles in planning string lengths? Even if it's accepted that the piano was made as early as the middle of the 18th century, the principles used in laying out the strings were from an even earlier period. Everyone who learns about the past from artifacts knows that the product of human creativity is a manifestation of all the influences acting on the maker. Where did they live? What had they learned and from whom and from where? What was their idea of beauty and utility? In short, what would lead them to make this particular design? These are the DNA these are the DNA of an artifact. And the best part is that the evidence of all of this is encoded in the physical object. If we can read the code, we can begin to see that world in which the object was conceived and made. In short, we just might find the answers to many of those questions. There will be an article in the next AMIS journal, and we can leave some of the hardcore organology details for that medium. Our preliminary conclusion was that our maker was a skilled Pennsylvania German organ builder, of which a dozen or more individuals are candidates, depending on how late the instrument might have been made. But as we went deeper in our investigation, there were clues about when the instrument was made, pivotal clues of an origin even earlier than we had imagined. The list of possible makers became much shorter. Stringed keyboard instrument makers have to figure out how long to make the strings. Too short for a given pitch and the sound suffers. And too long, the string breaks before you get up to pitch. Various mathematical and geometrical schemes have gone in and out of vogue over the centuries. The strings on this little upright piano didn't fit the usual schemes we would expect for an 18th century piano. Graphing the scale, we would expect a more common Pythagorean scale, closer to the red line in this diagram. 
At first, I wondered if the maker was naive about string scaling and making an, uh, novice mistakes. But the maker's otherwise high level of instrument making skills said, no, look deeper. It eventually became clear that the maker was following an identifiable and intentional non-Pythagorean scheme that reinforced his credentials as an organ builder and more tellingly indicated someone who was still using much older scaling uh, concepts. I tried to explain this in my Jameis article, but while reviewing my draft, John Coster became so interested in the scaling of this instrument and it overlapped with uh, research he had been done, uh, doing for many years, that he dropped everything and wrote a companion article for the same issue of the journal. Coster gives extensive analysis uh, of the evolution of string scaling that led up to the system used in the MHS piano. We can leave it to the journal article to tell us that long, uh, technical, but very revealing story. Two major factors now point uh, to this instrument as being older than anyone would expect of an American-made piano. First is the implication of such an old-fashioned approach to laying out the strings. Second is the almost unique form the instrument takes. We had always assumed it was more likely the MHS, MHS piano was made late in the 18th century when pianos were starting to catch on. But think about it. Anyone making a piano in the 1770s or later would have been influenced by these widely accepted forms. But it's as if our maker had never seen a piano before and was practically inventing it from scratch. After looking at all these clues, it was time to play connect the dots. And we arrived at a fairly stunning hypothesis that the maker of this instrument was, in fact, the person already known as America's first professional keyboard instrument maker. Born in 1690 in Dresden, Johann Gottlieb Klemm spent the first half of his adult life as a practicing maker of organs, harpsichords, and clavichords in Dresden until he emigrated to America in 1733, soon settling in Philadelphia and anglicizing his name to John Clem. Clem is already a familiar name in both Moravian and American musical history and is survived by only one signed instrument, this spinet of 1739 in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was himself an on-again, off-again Moravian and is perhaps best known for training the young David Tannenberg who later became the most celebrated organ builder in early America. A Clem attribution for the MHS piano might have been suggested much sooner, yet writers have been appropriately cautious about doing so. Clem, after all, had already died in 1762, well before any pianos are otherwise known in North America. Even considering his earlier decades as a keyboard maker in Dresden, Clem left Germany as experimentation with piano making had only barely started there. At first look, Clem seems to simply predate the era of the piano. Yet this instrument's particular mix of characteristics are easier to explain given Clem's formative period in Dresden. That's the time and place where Pantaleon Hebenstreit was at the peak of his fame. Hebenstreit was a spectacularly popular virtuoso who toured Europe performing on a type of oversized hammered dulcimer named after him, the Pantalon. This image is not him, but one of his students. And the original Pantalon was actually much larger than the one shown and may have, been, uh, and may have stood upright. Through his ability to elicit a variety of sounds from his pantalon by using hard and soft mallets and different sets of strings, Hebenstreit has been widely credited with influencing the first generation of Saxon piano makers. It would have been obvious to enterprising organ and harpsichord makers 
that if only they could find a way to add a keyboard to this popular but difficult to play pantalon, it would make the pantalon accessible to anyone who could play a keyboard, not to mention a profitable new product for their workshops. These early experiments in Saxony uh, were not attempts to make pianos. Practically speaking, pianos hardly existed in 1720s Dresden. But when you think about it, adding a keyboard to a dulcimer, uh, it fits the definition of a piano. In fact, years later, and only after the piano finally became widely accepted, several Saxon keyboard makers claimed to have invented the piano independent of Christophery. Christophery was the Italian harpsichord maker rightly credited as being the first inventor of the piano. John, uh, uh, John Coster proposed in the 1990s uh, that there was not one but two nearly contemporaneous inventions of the piano, one in Italy and the other in Germany. Uh, Michael Latcham independently arrived at the same idea in his recent book, Towards a New uh, History of the Piano. But Latcham's book greatly expanded on the concept, demonstrating how the first century of piano history was an intertwining of two lineages. The Hebenstreit-inspired Dresden lineage was characterized by the ability to create different kinds of sounds, like the hard and soft mallets of Hebenstreit's pantalon. Also, dampers were rarely provided, but if they were, some method was usually provided to turn them off. In contrast to the Hebenstreit-inspired pianos, Christophery was not interested in providing a variety of sounds. For Christophery, the piano's expressive power came from its being touch sensitive, giving players the ability to shape phrases through continual nuances of volume. All of this is not to dispute that Christof uh, Christophery invented the piano sometime around 1700 in Italy, but to acknowledge a separate German tributary to that stream, a separate lineage that remained influential in piano design into the second decade of the 19th century. The German lineage was responsible for a fascination that persisted through the 18th century, a fascination with stops that could change sound like an organ or harpsichord or dulcimer. The appearance of stops for so-called Turkish music are best known, where the pianist could strike a drum and bells with a foot pedal, but there was much greater diversity of piano stops that appeared throughout the century than you might think. Given the narrow range of forte piano types heard in today's historically informed performances, the Latcham book is eye-opening, uh, an eye-opening account of that diversity as the Dresden and Italian lineages intertwined until the Questoffery lineage finally won out. Yet perhaps the survival of a pedal to eliminate damping, not envisioned by Christophery, could be considered a remnant of the Dresden strand still alive in the modern piano. Twenty years after his formative period in Dresden in the 1720s, Clem was still an active keyboard instrument maker, now relocated to Pennsylvania, and having connections to the Moravians. As early as 1745 or early 1750s, a decade or two after leaving Saxony, the evidence suggests Clem got around to making a Hebenstreit-inspired keyboard instrument, piano, in the only way he imagined such an instrument. Having lived in America since 1733, he probably had not seen a piano with the possible exception of those early experiments going on in Saxony. We know of at least one hammered, uh, we know of only one hammered uh, clavier that was advertised in Leipzig two years before Clem left for America, but we don't know if Clem had seen that instrument or any other. 
And when he finally got around to making his Hebenstreit-inspired instrument, Clem naturally gave the player the ability to change whether the hammers strike the string with a soft leather tip or with a hard brass tip. He wasn't sure whether to bother adding dampers. Hebenstreit's piano didn't have any. So he ended up only installing dampers on less than half the notes and provided a hand stop to eliminate them entirely. When it came to laying out the string lengths, the old artisan used design principles he had learned in his youth, principles that already were becoming old-fashioned when he left Dresden in 1733. So attribution of the piano to John Clem provides plausible answers to all six of our questions, and I find no other uh, uh, candidate scoring so high by that criterion. This is not a self-aggrandizing uh, attempt to seize credit for connecting a famous name to our research project. Rather, it's the most plausible explanation for the design of an instrument that is, in all respects, unique in American keyboard history. If attribution to Clem is correct, this instrument sheds much new light on America's first professional keyboard instrument maker, and with a construction date before 1762, the year of Clem's death, it makes the MHS piano the oldest known surviving piano of any form made in America or England. And among the few examples from the beginnings of the Saxon lineage of the piano, the MHS piano appears to be a musical fossil, potentially one of the two earliest surviving examples anywhere. The other, uh, the other uh, instrument shown in the slide um, is in the Grassi Museum, University of Leipzig, and perhaps not surprisingly, is also in an upright form and rather similar to the MHS piano. So Tom Winter and I made that reproduction with Tom constructing the keys and mechanical parts in San Francisco and I the remainder of the piano in Williamsburg. The new reproduction gives voice virtually to the original instrument that stands a few feet away on exhibit in the Moravian Historical Society in Nazareth. This charming historical site has become a not to be missed stop for an early American keyboard history pilgrimage. Besides the Clem piano and its reproduction, you'll see other important instruments, including an organ, clavichord, and spinet, all by Clem's student David Tannenberg. Before we see a brief uh, video uh, recording of the instrument, I want to thank Tom and Michelle Winter for involving me in uh, this project. Susan Ellis, who's actually here today from Nazareth, is the Moravian Historical Society Executive Director and a strong and faithful supporter of the research. I must thank also John Coster and Michael Latcham who supported our research through their own work on the context that accounts for the MHS piano uh, and their critical review of our findings. Finally, I must thank Lawrence Libin for his vision, encouragement, and guidance throughout the project. Now we'll see a brief informal video to give an idea of the instrument's sound. It features two movements from Johann Kuhnau's Biblical Sonata No. 4, published in 1700. I don't know if Kuhnau was played by the Moravians, but he was one of the few Saxon contemporaries of Hebenstreit, uh, who was also skilled at playing the pantalon.
Thank you very much. Well, we wouldn't know what the temperament was, uh, but the pitch, the scaling actually could handle, uh, without strings breaking, a pitch up to 440. Um, what we're doing, uh, I think, is uh, keeping it tuned at 430, which happens to be the pitch of the Tannenberg organ a few feet away. Uh, and, and that's a perfectly plausible pitch for it. Um, have you compared stylistic uh, elements like um, moldings and, and the shape and sizes of keys of the clam uh, spinet with, with this instrument to further kind of um, give, give support to your, right, your right. hypothesis? Did, did you get the question? The question is, uh, have we compared uh, the, the MHS instrument uh, stylistic details with the clem, surviving clem spinet at the Metropolitan Museum of Art? Uh, I unfortunately have not been able to see the instrument myself, but uh, some of my colleagues examined it a few years ago and took uh, a few dozen photographs, which I've poured over very carefully. Um, the, uh, the spinet has had many alterations, uh, and uh, one of the most telling things might have been the keyboard, but the keyboard has been replaced. Um, another very telling thing would certainly be the scale of the spinet, and uh, the bridge and the nut are both gone and it's not able to, or not able to compare that. One, uh, one point of comparison though, well, a couple points I'll mention. Uh, the case of both instruments is uh, made of uh, walnut with an Atlantic white cedar soundboard. Um, and the other detail is that the molding that goes around the base of the spinet um, appears, and I've, I've, I've made just photographically, I've made, uh, I've been able to size them uh, to the same scale, and they seem to be a match. But we haven't had actually uh, uh, moldings made. Maybe I can get you to make moldings. <laughs> yes, indeed. Take one quick question, and then it's time for talking. Where'd you get your string wire? Uh, the wire, um, I, I used Malcolm Rose wire. Thank you so much, John, and thanks again to Tom for a nice session.